Yo, what up, what up, what up, and welcome everybody, welcome, I'm here with my brother Doku, and we got a fucking Peter Zeehan video for y'all, man, it's beautiful, man, you know I love Peter Zeehan and his predictions and things of this nature, and it's most definitely changed my worldview, and I'm hoping a few of yours, you know I mean, um, but to me, yo, Doku, say what up to the crowd, man. Yeah, what's up everybody, I'm, I'm here, I haven't listened to this guy before, but I'm curious to hear what he has to say. Yo, it's beautiful and it's brilliant, let's get to it, all right? All right. Author. He's got three published books. His most recent is called Disunited Nations and hit the market in March of this year. Peter, it's so great to see you again. Welcome back. It's a pleasure to be back. I wish we could do this in person. Peter, thanks for being Sorry, here. Sorry, should we're, I just go ahead and launch in? Yeah, please. We're anxious to, uh, to hear what you have to say. Okay. Um, we all know we're living in a very uncertain world right now. So thank you. My pleasure. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover today, and a lot of it is going to be things you really don't want to hear. So I want to start out with something calm that we all are in agreement in. So let's talk politics. Uh, what we have here is the percentage of each individual voting demographic who voted for Donald Trump. And of course, you subtract that number from 100, you get the number that voted for Biden. Uh, three things that we can take away from this. First, look at the edges. Republicans, 91% for Trump. Democrats, 4% for Trump. That's current self-identifying Republicans and Democrats who voted for their guy. No surprise there. But check this out. Wyoming and Vermont were the most extreme states in how they broke down. And as we know, like one third of Wyoming are still working cowboys. And as we know, in Vermont, they think of Bernie Sanders as just a little bit too conservative for them. Uh, but even there, we had roughly 30% of the population vote for the other guy. So that's within three points of the ratio that we've seen since I started following this sort of thing in 2000. And then third, look at that green block in the middle. That's the 6% spread. So uh, at most 11 to nine being the ratio. Now, is that statistically significant? Certainly that's what win, wins elections, but it's hardly what I would call a national division. We are not nearly as shattered politically as social media and the media would have us believe. Uh, the data just doesn't back it up. Does it mean that we haven't made any mistakes? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Does it mean that we need to overhaul our parties? Yeah. Does it mean we need to rebuild our media system? Sure. Does it mean we need to regulate social media differently? Of course. But it doesn't mean that we're broken. We can fix this. Every democracy in the world is going through exactly these sorts of issues. We are just louder about it. Okay. That's all I'm going to talk about. Doku, how you feel about that, my brother? Doku. Doku. All right. So <laughs> how do you feel about that green, that green breakdown in the middle? Because it, it's, it says a lot to me. Well, well what's it say to you? <sighs> so, so we got 50%, uh, 56% married men, 55% white, 55% small town, 52% of, uh, high school uh high school or greater so i'm guessing that's education 52 yeah. percent texas 51 percent married women so you've got the married couples in there already uh age 65 plus at 51 percent uh fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a year income that's at 50 percent catholic at 50 percent over a hundred thousand dollars per year at 47 percent unmarried men at 46 percent under fifty thousand dollars at forty five percent, and suburban at forty four. That's that's the vast majority of the United States. Uh, uh, to uh, to put that into contrast, people that voted for Biden, you have postgraduate at forty percent, unmarried women at thirty six percent, age eighteen to twenty nine at thirty six percent, Latino at thirty five, urban at thirty three, California at thirty three, Vermont at thirty one. That was the demographic he brought up. Uh, Jewish at 30%, Asian at 28%, Black at 8%, and Democrat at 4%. That is uh, uh, the Democrat uh, base that did not vote for Trump. 
But then you look at the numbers on the other side, Protestant, non-white college men, rural, Wyoming, uh, white non-college and non-white college. It, Trump should actually have the popular vote if this breakdown is correct. No, nah, because you lost suburban at forty at fucking fifty six percent. Went to Biden. Oh no, he still has suburban at forty four. Yeah, and that's that's the percentage that voted for Trump. So fifty six percent of them voted for fucking Biden. It's still, but you look at everything else. Age sixty five, uh, make or make, even the demographic making a hundred k. Married woman, married men, white. Those are uh, all above fifty percent. Age eighteen to twenty nine, he only got forty four percent, or he got um, he only got thirty six percent. That still that doesn't account for the making over a hundred k, making between uh fifty and a hundred k. That's the vast majority of people. The only people that That's voted 50%. for Biden are the ones that, oh, the only people that are voting for Biden are the ones that want, hey, the ones that want their uh their college debt forgiven. Well. And, I mean, if you look at it, it's unmarried men, people who make more than a hundred grand a year. So we're probably talking government workers, right? Um, the individuals who made under fifty thousand dollars who want a free handout, right? Suburban people, postgraduate, unmarried women, which is a massive portion of the population. Everybody age eighteen to twenty nine. So that's the Zoomers, right? Uh, Latino and urban. You know, I mean, he lost all of those. And that's the thing. He still got married men. He got married women. He got everybody making fifty thousand plus. Uh, he got. He almost got suburban by fifty. And, and by the way, have you seen this chart anywhere else? No, no. They won't talk about it. I'm I, sure I, they hang won't on, hang on, hang on. Man. I want. I want to say this right now. You're welcome, <laughs> Internet. <laughs> Tom Pease is the first one with a voter breakdown in the entirety of the Internet. <laughs> Shit, you're fucking welcome. God damn it. All right. Oh, look, man, let's let's keep going with this video because we got a lot to go yet. Legit. Yeah, <laughs> bang, like it, yeah, bang it out, man. Bang let's it keep out. Going. Conservative for them. Uh, but even there, we had roughly 30 percent of the population vote for the other guy. So that's within three points of the ratio that we've seen since I started following this sort of thing in 2000. And then third, look at that green block in the middle. That's the 6% spread. So uh, at most 11 to nine being the ratio. Now, is that statistically significant? Certainly that's what win, wins elections, but it's hardly what I would call a national division. We are not nearly as shattered politically as social media and the media would have us believe. Uh, the data just doesn't back it up. Does it mean that we haven't made any mistakes? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Does it mean that we need to overhaul our parties? Yeah. Does it mean we need to rebuild our media system? Sure. Does it mean we need to regulate social media differently? Of course. But it doesn't mean that we're broken. We can fix this. Every democracy in the world is going through exactly these sorts of issues. We are just louder about it. Okay, that's all I'm going to talk about politics. We can go into Q&A if you want to. Uh, but I want to spend most of the time talking about the international environment and foreign policy. So first, some review. The United States created the global order at the end of World War II so we could fight the Soviets. We made the world safe for commerce in exchange for military alliances to fight the Cold War. On this map kind of gives you an idea of who was who. The blue were the countries that we cared about before World War II. The green were the new allies in the new Bretton Woods global order, globalization. The yellow are what really matter because those are the countries that switched sides to join us and our global market in exchange for them flipping against the Soviets. But that war ended 30 years ago. Now, the countries that benefit the most from this system were the countries that it didn't do well before. Either they were resource poor like the Germans and they couldn't challenge the naval powers, or they had weak geographies like the Chinese, which turned them into prey for the empires. For the first time in their existence, countries like China could access resources and markets without having to secure them militarily because we took care of that. But making this system work required that the United States had troops everywhere to protect the sea lanes, to keep the Soviets at bay, to prevent the members of our alliance from picking fights with one another. But we're done. 
What we've got here is total US deployments overseas going back to World War II. As you can see, it's been trending down a long time. It's not that the United States is trying to decide whether it should leave. We've already left. The global order is now purely running on inertia. And anyone who's betting on globalization today is kind of betting on buggy whips about 10 years after the Model T started rolling off the line. So that's piece one. The global system cannot function without the United States. And the US has already left. Let's talk about the second piece, demography. All right, Doku, how you feel about that one right there? All right, that, that, this is actually a very, this is a very good breakdown. I guarantee you'll probably never see this anywhere except here. Except, except Tom Pease breaks it down on a regular basis to you, but I don't have all the charts and graphs for you <laughs> this, that this nigga has at the ready. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no but th this one actually is a really good breakdown because it, it, it explains a lot of what we've been saying about uh, post-World War II and what happened, especially with the Bretton Woods Agreement, with uh, the way that the global system has changed. It, the one I like the most is the Vietnam War, because if you look at a, if you look at that big spike, you know, that blue spike right there. What is what is that? Uh, what does that coincide with right there at 1968, 1969? Oh, yeah, there was something that happened in Vietnam, I believe uh, it allowed it allowed the United States to deploy its military forces without formally declaring war. I, I wonder what led to that spike. Hmm. I wonder. Well, yeah, I, I mean, like, you know, like it says Vietnam War underneath of it. <laughs> it <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying so with the, with the boat, with the uh, Gulf of uh, uh, Tencom, with what happened, it allowed the deployment of U.S. military forces without formal declaration of war, which took, took away any restrictions that the strength that we, we developed post-World War II since we, we came out of that as you know, the primary military power of the world. And yeah. then you see our, our presence go down and down and down up until the Vietnam War. Okay. Then it spikes right back up. And then obviously it comes back down and we don't have any major war. We don't have any major deployments. It kind of ramps up around the time of leading up to Desert Storm, but then it comes back down again. And then it goes down even further. See, Yep, and then you see the big spike in the Middle East right at 2001, as you would expect it, and then it goes back down again. And what this is indicative of is the fact that the United States has and has always been in the world police, as the joke goes, and this chart proves it. Now, granted, it's not the gigantic spike you would expect in a post-Korean War uh, during the Vietnam War, but you still see that that is a policy. But the thing is, though, is that we weren't an evil empire, as it were. No, it was, we were essentially at this point in time, we were trying, even during the Vietnam War, even though you could argue that there are some other aspects going into that. What it says is the United States is willing to escalate itself militarily, not to expand its power or influence, but to maintain the stability of trade and also to support the interest of its allies. And that's exactly what this chart shows. If there's no war, i.e. the period between 1989 all the way up until 2001, when Desert Storm was the only thing we really had to deal with, which ended relatively quickly by comparison, if you're looking at the Korean War or the Vietnam War, that's where you see that big down spike. And it only spikes up after 2001 when the United States made a large push into the Middle East for obvious reasons that we don't need to go into. But ever since the peak in 2008, 2010, it's been de-escalating ever since. It's, it, this is not, for all the people that say the United States is imperialistic and we're going after the oil and we're trying to do this. No, we're not. We're just securing the interests of our, or the interest of our trade partners and we're maintaining the stability of trade routes. Because that's what the United States has been doing ever since post-World War II. And this chart proves it. Very basic, my friend. Thank you. That was a damn good breakdown. Let's keep going. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Some cannot function without the United States. And the U.S. has already left. Let's talk about the second piece, demography. Now, what we've got here is a standard demographic profile. 
children at the bottom, then young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, mortality tends to build it into a pyramid. Now, this is Mexico. This is what we call a consumption-led demographic. Because whenever you have a bulge in your population structure, roughly below age 40, it's all about the spending on cars and kids and college and homes. Now, when American political leaders and business leaders look at a demography like Mexico, we really like what we see. Two big reasons. First of all, expertise. When you're 40 and under, you're relatively new at your career. Your value add is relatively low. So the Mexicans excel at assembly and low-end manufacturing. That's not what Americans do well. We do design, we do the high end. So the possibilities of integrating supply chains between those two systems are great. Second, consumption. All those young Mexicans absorb a lot of goods, including American agricultural output. So the propensity for trade between the United States and Mexico is huge. Mexico became our largest trading partner in calendar year 2019. It's a position they will not give up in our lives. But look at the bottom of that pyramid from roughly age 25 down, you'll notice it just kind of drops off. The same thing that has happened in Germany and in Norway and the United States is people move into urban environments, they have fewer kids. The same thing is happening in Mexico, which means that net migration from Mexico to the United States has now been negative for 10 straight years. And that's simply because they are starting to have fewer young people. You should count on that continuing forever. And it's not just Mexico. Here's the combined demography of the Central American states. They're facing exactly the same thing, but from five years later in time. So the inflows of labor that we've seen into everything, semi-skilled, unskilled labor from south of the border going all the way down to Panama, it's already peaked. It's only going to fall. I mean, we might get the odd flow here and there after a hurricane like we're seeing right now, but you should not count on labor coming up in the future. It's simply going to shrink from now on. So that's what a consumption-led system looks like. Here's the other thing. What do you think, my brother? He's not, he's, he's not wrong. And uh, I don't know why a lot of people find this a difficult concept. So I'm going to take what he said because he was – far more articulate about it so i'm just going to break it down to i'm just going to break it down to really simple terms as as consumption is more is more of the viable economic system especially in mexico and the central american states everywhere south of the united states border consumption is primarily what is becoming just like what's happened to the united states post world war 2 that is primarily the economic focus of the younger generation and so if you're built on a consumption-based economy, these people, these young people coming from Mexico or Central America, they're going to move to where there's work, to where there's labor. And as he said, yeah, the United States, we usually tend to do high-end things. That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that we don't have jobs for these people. And it's, it's ironically the argument that a lot of people make on the, uh, on the left where – you know, Americans don't want to go work on a farm. They've had this degree, even if it put them in, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars debt or whatever. They're not going to. Well, like I, I, I argue against that on a regular basis by saying it's not the fact that Americans don't want to work on a goddamn farm. It's that they're not willing to pay Americans what it would take to get them to go work on a fucking farm. And I mean, well, that's exactly. the issue. You know, I mean, it's the fact that like legit, like we've been using slave labor for so long that we've knocked down the price that, you know, I mean, like it's just unreasonable to be able to hire an American to fucking do this goddamn work. That's the problem. Well, it's, exactly. Well, and that's that's the issue that you see a lot of this. Uh, what he's talking about is an exodus of younger laborers. They might not be skilled in the sense that we consider them skilled, but they're skilled enough to do the work that they claim Americans don't want to do. Which maybe to some degree is true. I I tend to disagree, but well, no, no, no. They're yeah. having they're having a the problem in Central and fucking Central America and Mexico as a whole, where everybody's moving to the fucking cities because that's where all the jobs are. The Toyota plants, you know what I mean, and all that type of shit that they have there, right? All the assembly jobs are in the fucking cities, so they're all well, moving to the cities, and you don't have kids in the city the same way you have them when you're a rural dirt farmer in Tijuana. You know what I mean? Well, and more specifically, they're moving to areas where not only is there opportunity, but
but there's also enough pay that it actually feeds the consumer-based economy that they're used to. Uh, even if it's only having a little bit of money to where you can buy two sticks of bubblegum as opposed to one, they're like anybody else, they're obviously going to seek out where the better opportunity is. And it's clearly not doing what what has been viable, you know, four, five, six decades ago. And that's why you see this this demographic shift. It's also why you see migration in the way that we do now. And it's not like this is something new. It's just it's going to pinch one industry in favor of another. That's what you're seeing. That's what he's talking about. Well, yeah, I mean, and not only that, like, here's the truth of the matter, like legitimately. It's, you know, look, Americans have to understand that your currency has been devalued to the point where, like, they can't hide it anymore, right? And that's the issue that they're having, right? They can't hide the fact that they're devaluing the fucking currency to the level that where a banana should cost $10. <laughs> like, it's just a fact of life, you know what I mean? And, like, they're going to have to fucking, Americans are going to have to accept the fact that they've been pushed that far down the fucking chain. And they're going to have to demand more money. And the only way they're going to be able to do so is to get rid of all the goddamn immigrants in the fucking country. And they go, yeah, we're not bringing anybody else to fuck in here until you raise our fucking wages and we get back to where we're supposed to be. And we'll have hyperinflation for a little bit. But they've, they've run the system out to the end of the day. And that's why they want to bring in this great reset bullshit. Well, again, that's the thing. They People want to maintain a degree of some kind of competitiveness. But if you're trying to compete with people that are willing to work for half of what you're willing to work for, even if it's set by law, this is why minimum I, – I, sorry to get off on a quick tangent, but it's a quick tangent. This is why minimum late wage laws will not work with the way current immigration practices are enforced is because, sure, you can put your minimum wage law in place. That's not going to stop the fact that you're not going to be competitive against somebody coming up from Central America or Mexico. You're not going to be getting those jobs. It's going to be cheaper to hire them, even if they have to do another table. It, that's just yeah. the way economics works. Yeah, well, you know, they don't fucking understand this shit. You know what I mean? That's really where it's at. So let, let's let's yeah, keep going. Fair. Let let's keep going with this motherfucking shit. You know, what I mean, again, this dude breaks down things that like most individuals wouldn't really be able to grasp. You know what I mean? Hey, right. bang it out, man. <laughs> let's keep going. It's going to shrink from now on. So that's what a consumption led system looks like. Here's the other thing. This is an export led system. Now, the Koreans had a baby bust that started 45, 50 years ago. They never recovered. And so now they've got this huge surge of population. Doku, do you, do you know what the Koreans' uh, birth rate just hit? No idea. It, ready? That, you ready? You ready? I'm not familiar with. You ready for this? Do you know what their birth rate just hit? Uh, hit me. 0.73. Oh, that's well. That I'm sure that's perfectly sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> Legit, like yo, it is point seven three is the level where it is right now. That's 2020 numbers. Like somebody, uh, somebody South just Korea? yeah, South Korea. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't see uh, an aging population with a low birth rate possibly becoming an economic <laughs> hindrance. <laughs> At the, you know, that definitely that definitely would never happen yeah look at that chart ever dude. legit what do they got they got uh 49 45 to 49 so they got maybe they got 20 years and that big chunk in the middle is all retired and it's done for it's done so dude right yeah they're not even replacing a one for one i thought the u.s was bad but damn dude like, yeah, the U.S. ain't even that bad. The U.S. is 1.8. We ain't even nowhere near the fucking, like, yo, again, like, it's urbanization, right? It's the most urban areas, right? Taiwan, for instance, I think is number two after Korea right now, right? And then it's Japan, and then it's motherfucking Thailand, right? Like, yo, and then it's Indonesia, right? And then it's fucking Germany, right? And France and for, for, uh, Italy, right? Like, all these countries are, oh, oh the UAE, for instance. Yo, did you know United Arab Emirates, do you know what their number is? No, I have no idea. 1.24. Really? Yeah. Like, yo, it's not that's, feminism, nigga. That's it's, higher than I That's higher than I expected, actually. <laughs> yo, but I'm saying, though, right? Like, it's like the last one was 0.73, right? But I'm saying 1.24, right, for a fucking Muslim country. 
yo, fucking yo, Saudi Arabia is at 1.9, right? Fucking um, Iran's at like 1.7. What is, what is the U.S. at? 1.8. Hmm. This is what I'm now, saying. I guess, the, I guess the big question there would be, uh, what's the birth rate compared to uh, U.S. citizens versus otherwise? But I guess that's a topic for another day. Well, I mean, like, he's going to go into that right here. That's what he's going to do. He's going to show you. You know what I'm saying? But, like, I wanted, I just wanted to throw that in with the South Korea thing, just, like, to, to hit you and then anybody else who watches this so they understand, like, really where we are. People are going to get pissed off about this video. Like, oh, man, why don't you just let it play? Like, shut up, motherfucker. Like, I'll, God damn it. Like, I'll do what I want on my channel. <laughs> yeah, listen, listen and learn something, damn it. Now let's bang the rest of this shit out. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. 50s. Now, people in their 50s have been at their job for two, three decades. They know every in and out of the trade. They're very productive, very high value add, which means that Korean products are going head to head with American products. But even worse, there aren't a lot of people in their 20s and 30s in Korea. So all that production has to be exported. So we will never have a trade relationship with the Koreans that is what we would consider equitable. Demographics prevent it. So Mexico we see as a partner, but Korea we see as a competitor. Now from the point of roughly 1980 until roughly 2015, the world as a whole was in this wonderful demographic moment. All of the world's major economies were either consumption-led or export-led. Here's a bunch of the major ones back in the year 1980, I'm sorry, in the year 2000. And as you can see, everything was kind of in balance. And in the heyday of globalization with the Cold War over and the Americans still holding up the ceiling and making everything flow, it was great for trade expansion. And this is the world we've all become used to. But 20 years later, we are all 20 years older. And that global demographic of high consumption was already ending. The export-led economies are aging into mass retirement in a kind of a post-growth scenario. And the consumption-led economies are aging into export-led economies, but there's no one to export to. The real kicker is that the year 2022 is when all this flips. That's the year that most of the world's export-led economies age into post-growth. And most of the consumption-led economies age into export. So the whole balance is to skew. And the entire economic model that we have based everything upon for the last 60 years no longer applies. Now, for the United States, we are kind of in the middle. Uh, the real difference is our baby boomers. Now, they will age into mass retirement in the year 2022 on average, along with everybody else in the advanced world. That's not what makes the boomers special. What makes the American boomers special is they did something that a few other boomers in the world did. They had children. We have something that the rest of the advanced world lacks. We have the millennials. And I, I can't believe that I'm saying this, but the millennials will probably save us all because their consumption today is fueling growth. In fact, their consumption since the financial crisis is what kept us out of recession. We probably would have had three industrial recessions since then, if not for the millennials. And as the millennials age into their 40s and eventually 50s a decade from now, they will start providing the tax base and the investment capital that drives everything else. And nobody else has that. Let me give you an idea of scale. This is the world's consumption-led economies stacked up in terms of GDP today. Here's where we're going to be 10 years from now. So it's a moderate drop, not catastrophic, but not great. But here are the export-led economies. Now, today, we only have one post-growth economy. That's Japan. But if you fast forward 10 years, folks, global production has already peaked. Global capital supplies have already peaked. Global consumption. What do you think, my brother? Oh, man. They're... There is a lot to break down in that, and if anybody listened to this, I I highly suggest you go back through and listen to what he said because whole <laughs> whole man, hey, he's not wrong. Everything he said is correct. It, so I guess let's start with the obvious. 
when you have a shrinking population and what is largely a a consumer based economy and you juxtapose that against an increasing economy that is largely producer based he's right it is the millennials that are keeping this economy afloat with the help of the fed and the fact that we print money and devalue the currency but that's neither here nor there is the fact that we continue to consume what other countries produce and that is what is keeping our economy going now what he didn't touch on that i find i find to be an important an important point is that while well, yes the the millennials the consumers are keeping this economy going but you can't ignore the fact that they are also laden with debt and that debt is directly tied to the united states dollar and the fact that we're the reserve currency uh, as i'm sure you know pinoid i'm not going to preach to the choir but that is an issue. It's not like we're creating any economic value aside from the fact that we're consuming everything that the rest of the world produces, which is the only thing that's keeping them going. It is a, it's a, it's a bad relationship. It's, it's a Ponzi it's a scheme. Girl, well, it's a Ponzi scheme, but it's it's essentially a bitchy girlfriend and a rich boyfriend who every time she throws a temper tantrum, he go he goes out and buys her a new fucking diamond ring or a new fucking bracelet and spends money that he doesn't fucking have. Uh, that is the relationship between the producing and the consuming economy of the East and the West. Uh, and it doesn't matter. I'm not even talking about China. Uh, look at Indonesia, Turkey, Vietnam, all these countries. The relationship they have with the consuming West is that of a, a bitch-made boyfriend just buying his girlfriend whatever she wants just to keep her happy. And she just keeps producing what the what makes the boyfriend happy. In this case, it would be China keeps producing things that we can turn around and take and say, oh, well, in the sense of like a car. Do we produce any of the inputs that go into actually building the engine or do we just plop the engine into the car? No, we let the rest of the countries do it because they can do it for fucking far cheaper. Uh, the corporations are more than happy with that. And... What does the United States economy? What does the United States economy do? We continue to consume debt. We go ahead and buy these cars that are produced cheap as garbage overseas that just get put together at the very last moment here in the United States, so they don't have to worry about tariffs. And those corporations turn around and fucking sell it to you. Does it produce anything? No, it doesn't. What it does do is it keeps the economy afloat because the Fed can continue to do money printer go brrr, and. Well, we don't collapse. Well, what it does yeah. is what it does is allow almost like a circle of life in the goddamn economy, right? So, what it is is it's people who live in the goddamn who who are living off the service sector and the public sector jobs, standing here taking on debt to buy cars that end up going to people who are in the motherfucking actual productive capacity of the society, and they're the individuals who are you know I mean basically you know I mean designing and uh, you know doing all the technical work and things of this nature, and then they invest it inside of the individuals on Wall Street who can you to be able to like you know i mean chase yield so they can continue to have credit to loan out to the individuals to buy the fucking cars and the process repeats itself right but what in the meantime they're standing here taking all this money and shipping it overseas to buy all those parts for the cars but the service sector economy individuals are able to continue to you know i mean p take out fucking loans to be able to buy them fucking cheap ass parts to keep the shit fucking moving but it's just a giant goddamn ponzi scheme at the end of the fucking day you know i mean it's a snake eating its own fucking tail and eventually it's going to get to the goddamn head and it's going to fucking you know I mean, you swallow itself. It's really what it is. No, yeah, you're not wrong. It, it's, it's a really bad combination of a debt-based and consumer-based economy that is producing just enough to allow consumption to keep the economy afloat, but not producing anything above that to make it competitive. It, and again, it is, it is all propped up on you know, larger corporatism, larger globalism, larger you know, debt-based fiat currency policies that keep the system going just enough that it doesn't collapse, but not enough so much that you can actually, at this point in time, be a competitive economy to you know, consumer or producer based economies like well, China, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's like the people off slave labor. It, it's, it's the inventors invent products and they get built in China and then they come here and get shipped around by American fucking tax, American taxpayers who fucking stand here and, you know I mean? Get regulated by individuals who fucking collect the tax money and they all fucking try to spend to be able to, you know I mean? Kick the money back up North while the individuals who are, you know I mean? They buy those fucking goods and then those fucking goods are fucking, you know I mean? The goods pro profits are reinvested inside 
out of the market and the market is used to credit you know i mean to give credit to the individuals on the bottom to continue to fucking you know i mean get their asses back to work again and it, again it's just a giant motherfucking snake eating its fucking tail well exactly that's the thing it's you have enough people generating enough wealth that it keeps the system going while in the meantime you have enough people that have enough money whether they're earning it paycheck to paycheck or if they have to rely on debt from time to time it's enough money that they can they can consume enough to keep that system going which keeps the united states economy going keeps uh, the european economy going and it props up the producer economies like again indonesia vietnam turkey china it's enough to keep them going because we can continue to consume but it's all predicated on debt and consumption without the united states he's he's 100 correct without the united states this system would have failed a long long fucking time ago well yeah i mean like we've been the largest consumer of goods since the 19 fucking 30s and shit you know that's just part of life but all right, yo, look, man, we've been, we've been, we're fucking at 35 minutes on this fucking video, and for, we're at 18 on the video we're going through. <laughs> and we got an hour and 25, yo. I told you, we're going to be here a little while, so let's keep banging. Consumption has already peaked, and they will now steadily, or in some cases, catastrophically drop off over the course of the next several okay, years. Okay, pause on that one. Pause real quick. And they will not. All right, go ahead. What he just said is important. Yeah. And this is something else. I forgot to mention this. In order for this consumer debt-based producer economy dichotomy to work, you have, you have to have the population grow, at least at a 1.001 level. If the consumer population does not grow above that... Yo, it's 2.1. It's, it's 2.1. They have to have 2.1 kids per broad. Oh, shit. What, oh, I said 1. 1. Yeah, 1. Yeah, yeah. 2. 1. 1. 1. You have to have 2.1 kids per woman in order to have that shit grow. But here's the thing. Exponential growth is no longer possible anymore. Just a secret that, you know, I mean, a lot of motherfuckers don't want to admit to. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it was important to point that out, though, because you have to have an exponential growth in population to continue to have enough people just consuming to keep this type of economic system viable. Because if, if your population starts shrinking... Guess what? You don't have enough people buying enough McDoubles to to make that system viable. It's gonna collapse. Well, not just not just that. You don't have enough people on the bottom to pay for the individuals who are gonna receive all the goddamn benefits in retirement. <laughs> oh, I wasn't even gonna get into that. If you want to bring that into the case, it's probably closer to like two point seven, two point eight. But anyways, I just wanted to point that out. So uh, keep right, banging. Yeah, let, let's keep going. In our lifetimes, remember, you want to grow a thirty-year-old consumer? It takes thirty years. And that was before coronavirus. What I've got here is the U.S. infection rates from coronavirus uh, by a few states. Now, the arrows are pointing at five per 100,000. That's generally considered uh, the daily infection rate that indicates that the virus has become endemic in your population, meaning that the only way that you can possibly root it out is with a mass inoculation program of an effective vaccine, or at least a three-month serious lockdown that affects at least 85% of the population. Most of the country soared past that back in April, and we've never come back. Now, I'm showing here the four most populated states in the country, New York, Texas, Florida, and Pennsylvania, as well as yours, Utah, and Idaho. And you can see that everybody is just well, well, well above what you consider a safe level. Now, America as a country has massively mismanaged this crisis. And I mean that at all levels, not just the federal level or the presidency, but at the state and the local level as well. Governors have assumed that even when the next state over is having an epidemic, that it's just magically going to stop at the state line. Uh, mayors across the country have done the same thing. Personally, I think the university system has been the worst because you know these are supposed to be the smart people and they brought in the kids for in-person classes. They left the dorms open. And then if you got sick, they just sent you home. Make it somebody else's problem. We actually had a lot of universities who saw the infections rates among their students. And so after Thanksgiving, just didn't allow the kids back. Uh, that made the epidemic far, far worse than it needed to be. And now we're dealing with the Thanksgiving rush. So we're stuck with this. We're stuck with all of the economic outcomes of this until we have a mass inoculation program. 
So COVID is no longer a one-off effect. It's a deep-seated recession that affects everything. And that means that the shifts, the shifts in consumption patterns that we've been suffering through have legs. So retail, entertainment, travel, tourism, those are the obvious ones. But as you guys know, within ag, there's been big shifts. When people don't eat out as much, the foods that they eat in restaurants like steaks and bacon and cheese, prices change. We get gluts. And the things that you eat at home, like ground beef or chicken, prices go up. Every sector is experiencing something like that. And every sector will continue to experience things like that until we have the population immune to this. Which leaves us with the question, how soon can we have an effective, widely distributed vaccine? And on that, I actually have some good news. Now, the term is called herd immunity. I'm sure you've heard it before. And for something like COVID with a relatively low mortality, but a very high infectiousness, we need at least 70% of the population, preferably 85%, to be inoculated. Now, New York City, the most infected city in the country, only had about 20% exposure. Most of the rest of the country is about half that, although it is rising very rapidly. So at a minimum, we need to get half the population vaccinated in order to get us to that 70 to 85% range. On that front, things look good. The UK started immunizations yesterday. This is the uh, second person that the Brits inoculated. This is literally William Shakespeare because you know Brits. Uh, I've got some good news here. So we've got the Pfizer and we've got the Moderna vaccines, which will likely be approved by the FDA for widespread use this week. And we already have enough vaccine manufactured of these two versions to probably inoculate all healthcare workers in the United States by the end of the first week of January. After that, we will move on to long-term care facilities, then people whose jobs put them into contact or in motion a lot, bus drivers, airplane pilots, that sort of thing. And then we'll get to the general population probably uh, around April 1st. So, there's a few things about this you have to keep in mind. First of all, distribution. One of the things about both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines is that they have to be frozen. Uh, but the news is getting better. So when this all started four months ago, the initial vaccine formula had to be frozen for both of them at negative 94. But they were using a new technique called mRNA that had never been used before. So they really didn't know what the storage capacity is. So what happens is every couple of weeks, they take things out of the deep freeze, they move them into a different refrigeration unit that's a little bit warmer, hold it for a month, and then try it out again. And four months on, we've discovered that the Pfizer vaccine doesn't have to be at negative 94. It only has to be at negative 70. And the Moderna one only has to be at negative 20. And those numbers keep getting better and better and better. So we'll use Pfizer and Moderna now for the big point immunizations, hospitals, care homes, large employers. And probably in another month, the Oxford vaccine will enter the mix and the Johnson & Johnson one will enter, enter the mix. And the J&J &J one, that's the one I have the big hope for because it could, just needs to be refrigerated and it's a single shot instead of a double shot. So those will probably handle the less densely populated regions. That's probably what you're going to be seeing in your region outside of the major cities. So mass immunizations of the general population will probably begin by April 1, and we will probably reach that target of having half the population inoculated by sometime in June. So COVID is likely to get bottled up by the end of the second quarter, and the economy can then use the third quarter to kind of repair itself because we have had now a year-long recession. Figure the weird pricing trends that we've seen will unwind as the U.S. economy repairs itself. So probably by the time we get to September, most of this is gonna be in the rear view mirror. Now the new administration is not gonna speed this up at all. Even if the new Congress passes a new COVID mitigation and, and um, recovery program on day one, you shouldn't expect that policy to generate any meaningful outcomes until at least May. Add in a few months for the measures to really take effect and we're already pushing years end, which pushes us after the likely COVID recovery. Anyway, it's still overall good news, but here's the bad news. Same data set, seven-day moving average, cases per capita, 
across comparable data, but instead of showing it for US states, I'm now showing it for countries. This is the world's six largest consumption-led economic systems. And as we've learned with COVID, the data can't necessarily be trusted because you can't test everybody every day. So in the United States, in the United Kingdom and France, figure the actual caseloads are at least double. And for the developing countries, Brazil, Mexico, India, figure they're at least quadruple, which means everybody's well over that five level where we're endemic. So of the world's top 20 consumption-led systems, only Australia is not facing a health collapse. And Australia is under lockdown, so it really doesn't matter from an economic point of view. Consumption-led economies of the world are all offline. And they're desperately bringing their manufacturing needs in-house for reasons of health, national security, populism, and jobs. Which means that if you're an export-led system, you no longer have anyone to sell to. And this is going to last for at least the rest of this calendar year. I'm sorry, the next calendar year. And in case of the developing world, into 2022. Which means this is it. It's over. Most countries will never return to where they were in calendar year 2019. And the export-led systems that were hoping to make the adjustment before 2022, when the bottom falls out, they have lost all the time. Globalization is done. Now you remove globalization, you remove the Americans from the equation, and you're gonna get a series of brush fire wars in these regions. All right, my brother, this was recorded, I think, in this on December 12th, I do believe. Right. So it's a little behind, you know, because we're in January right now. But, you know, I mean, like, you know, what do you think about his predictions? I don't disagree with his predictions. They they are correct. And when when you have a consumer based economy that shut down even for one quarter, let alone a year. It that's that's going to hit your economy like nothing else. It, it's especially specifically countries like China. It, 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 with the level of population that they have, with the level of production they have, they can't produ produce enough food to feed their own population. They have to import it from the United States. It, in the United States and Australia, I believe the United States is uh, sorghum, soybeans, saline hogs, and I believe Australia is barley. It, this, this is going to hurt the Chinese economy for... As he said, it, at least two years. I, I would argue longer, but who knows? The one thing I do find uh, questionable at his, uh, about his assessment is not what he said, but what he didn't say. Knowing that we are a consumer-based economy, specifically a debt-based consumer economy, all of these businesses, specifically small businesses, that have been forced to shut down, lay people off, yeah, that are never going to open their doors ever again. We're not going to bounce back in the same way that I believe that he's trying to trying to paint this picture. It's well, far too. Well, let me let me let me point this. Let me put this like this. I think that this is going to open the door for new businesses that are going to take over. Um, and in my neck of the woods, restaurants never shut down. <laughs> it's like, you know, like there's been some mom and pop diners, you know what I'm saying? Like in some places that shut down in a couple of bars. But the reality is, is the vast majority of our restaurants are still open. They're just doing takeout like they've always and, have. Yeah. But even then, though, that we're at best, you're talking about stagnated growth. And at worst, you're talking about shut down and will not open ever again. And those are lost jobs to the economy. It's not like everybody floated through this without any type of yeah, any type of negative impact. I mean, there there are areas that that was indeed the case, but that's not indicative of the larger the larger consumer based providers. And you have to remember, we are a consumption service based economy first and foremost. We're not a producer, oh, and I there is enough damage done. I, th I think there's a shit ton of money sitting in the market <clears throat> waiting to fucking be released as credit for fucking new businesses. Legit. I don't I know. That's going to that's really going to depend on when we open up and what level of credit the banks are going to be willing to give to people. And I don't think we've seen that yet. I mean, uh, I think it, it will. To be blunt, it hasn't happened. I, I mean, but to I, what to, 
to what degree though? Because a, a we, big one. We also have to think. Well, but we also have to think about like what what level of debt like. What what is this going to do to the property values? What is this going to do to rent? If, oh, what like, is yo, gonna... it's going to drive. Like, here's the bitch. Property values are through the goddamn roof right now, which is fucking retarded considering the fact that 30% of people are facing fucking eviction, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, that's, that's the thing. There's so many moving parts to this particular situation that it's really going to be contingent on not only small factors, and they will be regional. Like, some areas might bounce back, no problem. Other areas might just go bankrupt, and you'll never be able to open up a business ever again. Just because values know. will be I that high. I don't like. I don't. I don't think that's right. I'm not saying. I'm not saying I can predict it, but I'm saying the possibility is a very real one. I think. It, I think it's going to be fucking. I think after the coronavirus is going to be a golden age for starting new businesses for new entrepreneurs. Well, re- remember this though, Pinoid. Remember what happened in 2008 when the banking, uh, the banking collapse happened, and they got their their bailouts. I, I don't think you're going to see small businesses or anything get those loans when you can have someone who's a slightly larger business or even, you know, is on the cusp of going public come in and say, hey, look, I got a little bit more money, a little bit better credit. You know, we saw that with regional banks. It, that's exactly what happened in 2008. I think you'll see the same thing again. I don't think you're going to see the return of mid uh, Main Street, small town America. And I think you're going to see more of a consolidation of you know, larger money, larger corporations, people that might actually have I, the ability to, I don't to, know, you man. know, actually go public I'm, on the markets. I'm, I'm be honest I, with you, dude. I have, while during coronavirus, I have watched wages go through the fucking roof in my area. On that's the thing. So rate wages go through the roof. Property values go through the roof. If you're someone who's just trying to start out, do you think the bank is going to loan to you or somebody that? Well, had no, but, money I'm to saying, the storm? but I'm saying, but I'm saying, but I'm saying, like the local population will be able to afford the fucking, you know, what I mean, the uh, the goddamn fucking new restaurants and shit, and the new businesses, and you know, what I mean, like the small stores that are going to open, they'll be able to afford to buy clothes there. They'll be able to afford to buy food. They'll be able to afford to buy hardware. You know what I mean? There's going to be a bunch of people fixing their fucking shit. And I think they'll be able to afford buying things, but I don't. I don't think you're going to see small businesses be replaced by other small businesses. Hey, the same I way that absolutely, in 2008, 2009. I absolutely do. I absolutely I don't, do. I like, don't know, man. I'm going to have to agree to disagree. I think. I mean, I think there's bigger, there's too many. Coming in. Yeah, there's too I many places get priced open. out of the market. Yeah, you know, there's too many goddamn open fucking holes in commercial real estate right now for them not to start businesses. Legit. And this is my prediction. I think you're going to see REITs. I think you're going to see REITs do very well. And I think you're going to see uh, real estate investment banks do very well. But I don't think you're going to see just somebody go to a bank and get a loan and open up a, a pizza place or a sub shop. I don't think you're going to see that. Not because it's not a viable option. I just think they're going to be priced out of the market and they're not going to be competitive for the people that actually have money who have managed to weather the storm. I, I don't see – I hope I'm wrong on that one. I know it's pessimistic of me to say this, but that's just the way the market works. If you're the guy who's sitting there with even two, three million bucks, which for a small business owner is not that much, it, you're going to be able to price out the person who's getting a loan for the first time. And I think you're going to see a lot of that. Maybe not on the coastal I don't know. I areas. Think- I, th- I think legit there's going to be a lot of fucking money moving down the chain to small businesses. I'll be honest with you. And especially in the towns to rebuild shit, especially with the Biden administration in fucking charge. They're going to be pumping fucking just dumping money in the local fucking ple- in the local fucking municipalities and shit and states like it's going to happen because they all need a fucking bailout. And while that all gets bailed out, that money is going to make its way into, you know what I'm saying, the fucking local municipalities and into, like, the local fucking businesses and the local fucking population. Like, it's going to happen. Maybe if you're a mom and pop shop that managed to survive this, but starting a new business, I think you're going to be priced out of the market on this one. I hope I'm wrong, but I I think you're going to see another 2009, 2010. Uh, I don't think this is going to be your moment. Unless you have, unless you have some money that's been sitting in the this, bank, this isn't this isn't this isn't like spend. this isn't like cars where you can destroy them. You know what I'm saying? Real estate's real estate, son. You know what I mean? Like it is what it is. But yeah, let, let's keep going because we got more shit to cover.
Now you remove globalization, you remove the Americans from the equation, and you're gonna get a series of brush fire wars in these regions. Now, for those of you who know your history, you'll recognize these as the areas that have seen the greatest conflict throughout the history of our species. It's where the world's major cultural and geopolitical tectonic states kind of grind together. For those of you who know your economic history, you will recognize these zones as the places that have seen the greatest economic growth of the last two generations. It's the order. It's the Bretton Woods system. It's globalization. It's base effect growth. The Americans forced everybody to be on the same side to fight the Soviets, and so trade happened, economic growth happened, and now it's going to unhappen. These zones are responsible for three quarters of manufacturing supply chain steps, three quarters of global energy shipments, and three quarters of global agricultural shipments. The supply chains that make our world work are shifting for reasons political and strategic and energy and labor and very soon war. And very soon, those chains are going to shatter simply because ships are not going to be able to make it to the places that matter. Let's talk transport. Now, back in the 1980s, there was a war in the Persian Gulf between the Iranians and the Iraqis. We called it the Gulf War. And by 1983, the war on land had reached a stalemate. So the two sides started flinging missiles at each other's civilian shipping. And that almost destroyed the global insurance industry because they didn't have any way to handle provisions for a ship getting hit. The American security overwatch had been so hermetically complete since 1945, everyone assumed there was no risk on the water. So we've now changed the way we handle shipping for insurance. Now, if you are sailing the ocean blue, you have to get an insurance policy every year worth about 2.5% the value of your vessel to be paid every year. That assumes you never sail into a war zone. Should you sail into a war zone, the cost of that insurance increases by a factor of 100 to be paid every week. That assumes no one in the war zone is shooting at civilian shipping. The first time someone takes a shot at a civilian vessel, your insurance policy is null and void, which means that as soon as you have any conflict in any maritime zone, no one will go there. And we're going to have a lot of conflict and a lot of civilian shipping lanes. All right, Doku, did you hear what just happened today? Uh, are you talking about the mine that was on the uh, Iraqi ship? The no, tanker? no, no, no. I was talking about the South Korean ship that got fucking um, that got fucking abducted by the Iranians. Oh well, we got two then. <laughs> so, <laughs> there, there was a mine. It was either today or yesterday that was attached to the side of a uh, an oil tanker in the Strait of Hormuz that was removed successfully. But you know, these things happen. Yeah, well, a South Korean tanker was taken along with all of its people by the Iranian fucking Royal Guard and shit. Okay, I didn't hear about that one, so uh, fill me in. Well, you know, I mean, that's what happened. You know, I mean, the fucking South Korean tanker, you know what I'm saying, with its whole crew was fucking abducted by the Iranian government on the fucking charge of uh, fucking carrying weapons or something along this type of lines. And they snatched it along with all of the fucking people on board. So South Korea is demanding its citizens and its boat be fucking released in the United States and South Korea. Well, South Korea is threatening to fucking use its ships in the area to fucking go and bomb the Iranians and the United States just moved uh fucking, you know, I mean, battleships back into the goddamn Persian Gulf to go deal with it. Well, <laughs> he wasn't wrong when he when he predicted that. Yeah, it's gonna happen. I mean, <laughs> it shipping shipping lanes like anybody who understands anything about warfare and how it works. Yeah, you can win warfare just through attrition or superior firepower. But if you really want to win a win a war, you win it by destroying the enemy's logistical capabilities. In this case. Well, what you're seeing happening in the shipping lanes. <laughs> and that is going to send the price of that is going to send the price of commodities way up. So if you're looking at oil potentially, but not necessarily. But if you're looking at any other type of commodity, especially steel, it 
expect to see steel and copper go up if this is allowed to continue, well, which I guarantee you will not be allowed to continue. Well, there's been some cool stuff that's been happening where uh, these individuals who have these fucking boats are literally scrapping the goddamn steel out of them because they don't have any fucking uh, shit to ship in them. Again, that's the thing. It's even if you took one of these boats, if the price went up, they'll actually scrap them and they'll sell them off. It's happened before in the past, and uh, specifically on the uh, the eastern coast of Africa, where they don't they don't try to attack boats because of what they're carrying, but just simply to scrap them. And there's an entire scrapyard of boats in India that were notorious for this back in the uh, late '80s and the early '90s. It was a big industry. Well, yeah, well, they're doing it in Brazil right now, but it's an actual yard that, like, companies are literally trading in their fucking ships just because, you know, they're worth more in fucking steel than they are to continue to operate because there's no fucking freight moving around. Exactly. So this guy's not wrong, but if this is allowed to continue, expect the price of commodities to go up and expect global trade to decrease. It's weird. Did you, and did that's you, going to increase tension. Did you watch my 2021 predictions video? No, I didn't get a chance to watch that yet. You should check it out because that's one of my predictions I made was that commodity prices were going to go up. Ain't that weird? And I legit, this is my first time seeing this video right here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've been calling this too. Like people were saying like, oh, well, you're stupid for betting on, you're betting on grain, you're betting on uh, livestock, you're betting on silver, you're betting on gold, you're betting on oil, you're betting on it's all going to go up. It's going to go down. And then it's going to continuously go up right after Biden gets inaugurated. It's going to happen. Yeah, there, there's no choice. You know what I mean? Like, fucking, like, they, they printed off too much money for commodities not to go up. <laughs> Just fact of life. But, yo, let's, let's keep banging right now. I just wanted to bring that fucking point up real quick. You know what I mean? Because I, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, bang it through. This is the end of most Trans-Pacific shipments. What about energy? For those of you guys who saw me before, you recognize this, of course. Uh, this is my cost versus volume graphic for energy. The taller the bar, the greater the cost of producing the crude. The wider the bar, the greater the volume that comes up out of the ground. Uh, OPEC is there on the far right in black. U.S. shale <clears throat> is in the light blue on the far left. Now, this is data from 2012. So back then, U.S. shale was the most expensive in the world. OPEC was wide and cheap. But this was almost 10 years ago. Since then, we've had breakthroughs in a number of technologies, and here's where we were at the dawn of the coronavirus crisis this year. Now, we have seen, because of coronavirus, oversupply issues and a lot of people shut in production. Overall, U.S. oil output dropped by 2 million barrels per day. But half of that is already back. Uh, in addition, we've had consolidation in the industry. Uh, if you have a lower price point, only the more productive wells make sense. A lot of structural shifts, not just technological, but it has forced a lot of the smaller and a lot of the less efficient players out of the market completely. So fewer mom and pops, more Exxons now. And then third, we have uh, drilled and fracked, but because these bigger players don't need the cash flow right away, they haven't necessarily hooked their wells up to the pipes. They've left them closed in. It's a frack log is the technical term in the industry, and it probably represents another million barrels a day, which means that the United States is within 30 days of being a net exporter again. Now, a few thoughts on this. Oil is the ultimate long sale commodity. It's far more dependent on safe transport than any other commodity. So any disruption in the global system at all has an outsized impact. Second, what happens to production costs and output reliability in a wider world where the Americans are not holding up the ceiling? And third, oil is the primary input in many more things than merely fuel, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, fertilizers. There's also another side to it. Now, this is a map of the world at night. Here's the most important city in human history. It's Marshalltown, Iowa, that's where I'm from. Here is Bismarck, North Dakota, the booming metropolis. And this is not a rave. This is the Bakken oil field, a shale project. And the reason it's lit up is that we have a hard time capturing natural gas from the shale fields. 
bubbles up as a waste product. And it can take three to 12 months to wrap it into the infrastructure system. And in the meantime, we have to flare it. You can see that from space, which means that natural gas, the most versatile industrial input on this planet is in the United States, a waste product. And what can't you do with a bottomless supply of it? We burn it for power, which is the primary reason US electricity costs are the cheapest in the world. But we've also completely retooled our petrochemical system. Now, this ridiculously overcomplicated graphic, let me just sum it up for you. If you start with the bottom left, that dark gray bar, that's crude oil. You can refine that into something called naphtha, and then you can process the naphtha into tens of thousands of daughter products that we use every day. Or you can start at the bottom right with natural gas. You crack it to get something called ethylene, and then that can be turned into daughter products. Now, under normal circumstances, you would only use natural gas as your base material to make this relatively narrow product set. Because natural gas is hard to move, it's hard to store, it disperses. And so normally there's a five to one price split between oil and natural gas. And because of that, you only use natural gas when you have no other option, except in the United States. Because in the US, natural gas is a waste product. And instead of a five to one ratio, it's more like two to one. So these are the products that we use natural gas for. And for you guys specifically, this is fertilizer, and that is pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. So the United States is now not only the highest volume, highest purity, highest quality, lowest cost producer for all of this, but the next time there is a global energy crisis, it's not gonna affect ag because on the input side, all the stuff we use oil for in the wider world is not how we do it here. We have a completely different supply chain that is both domestic and immune to international price changes. And it's gonna have a massive impact. What we've got here is crop intensity by acre in Africa back in 1950. And anything that is in pink or blue means roughly one third or less of the land is actually under till. And in a pre-industrial civilization, this is what you would expect because you only produce food in the areas that are capable of doing it with relatively low inputs. I mean, this is pre-synthetic fertilizers, pre-tractors, pre-gasoline. But when Africa was ushered into the global, globalized system, they were able to bring in those inputs and create zones where they could farm more intensively and take marginal lands and bring them into production. Because if you have these inputs, you increase output. Well, we saw food output in the continent increase by a factor of five over those same 50 years. <sighs> now undo the global system. If they can't get reliable equipment, capital, and other inputs, they're gonna go back to something much more similar to what we had 50 years ago. But while food output has increased by five, so has population. Let me give you an idea of how bad it's gonna be. Here are the world's major exporters of grain and soy. They're the blue. All right, before we go, before we move forward, did you know that about natural gas? I did actually, and I, I briefly debated getting into natural gas years ago. I missed a good run up, but well, now you're fucked. Correct. <laughs> you're never going to get any money out of natural gas now. And I, I recommend like oil's not a good market either at this point, to be honest with you. Uh, oil's only good if you're someone like me where you're trading the uh, you're trading the range. But if if you're buying it expecting it to go up by a factor of yeah uh, thirty forty percent in the next six months, it don't no. hold your breath. It's not, it's not going back up to 80, 90 bucks a barrel. It's not. Yeah, unless, unless you can invest in like, you know, like Saudi oil or something like that or Russian oil. Like that shit goes up and down by that fucking much. But that's only because, you know, I mean, it's not American. <laughs> like, yo, the demand and fucking demand and shit goes up and down due to like, you know, I mean, wars and things of this nature. But yeah, man, like I didn't like a lot of people don't know that about natural gas. That was something like I wanted to, you know, I mean, like make sure we touched on real quick before we moved any any further forward. Yeah, no, nat natural gas is a uh, is a viable energy alternative, not necessarily in the sense of we're going to use it to power our cars, but for everything else that we use crude to produce, 
and from fertilizers to plastics. We can do the same thing with natural gas. It's just it requires a little it requires a little more input. It requires a little more uh, a little more effort to achieve the same end result. But natural gas is so damn cheap. It's actually more effective to use natural gas because we have it in such abundance as opposed to crude, whether you're going off the WQI uh, price or Brent crude oil price doesn't really matter because we have that much of it. It's just it's not something that the markets view as as viable. Now, perhaps it might be a good time to get into uh, industries or companies that are involved in uh, purifying and refining natural gas to fit those needs. You might find some buying opportunities, but uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're actually we're getting there rather relatively quickly just because it's it's so damn cheap. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah, look. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to cut this right here and then like fucking we're going to start recording again. You know what I'm saying? That way, like, you know, we can, uh, you know, what I mean, like fucking like make this into two different videos because like I'll be honest with you. I'm concerned about how much more it's going to let me fucking record on this fucking this this file right here. You know what I mean? Hey, man, no worries. And right. like I said, there's a, cool. there's a lot to break down in this. So I feel you. We're, we're going to keep going. You know what I'm saying? On the other side. But like fucking we're going to stop here and then we'll make it in like a second video. You know what I mean? I'll drop both of them. And just, you know what I mean? Kind of the same time. I might premiere them or whatever the case might be. All right. So like, yo, we will be back in a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, fucking check out the next video. We're going to keep going. You know what I mean? There's lots more to fucking come. All right.